Hey, I'm the Catholic Neighbor. Welcome back to FM 24 Youth Factory, episode 59, as we prepare for the new season. I'll see if I can speed things along. Usually I come up short on trying to do that, but we'll see what we can do here. It's amazing the difference one year can make. Development of players just one year apart take us from 44 points in 20th to 90 points in second. And so very nearly a league title. I mean, an absolute collapse in the last five games with just one draw and four losses. We only had eight losses all year. Four of them came in the final five matches. Signs of a young young squad that's still growing, but we more than doubled our points haul even with that late season collapse. Speaking of collapse, Preston, Plymouth, Wrexham have all done exactly that to give way to Birmingham City, the last playoff team is the one getting that third promotion spot. It's probably going to be a pretty difficult ask for them going into the championship with that, but they have come away 2-1 wick, uh, 2-1 extra time victors against Plymouth in the final. Archie Jones has won Young Player of the Year, 33 appearances, 12 goals, 6 assists with a 7.28 uh, average rating. Lanahan Penrice was in the driver's seat for the Golden Boot all the way through the season from the very, very early stages until literally the final day where he's lost it. Same 23 goals apiece, but four assists for Jordan Hawkridge. And of course, that was us getting no goals in the final four matches. Sam Julian, though, does hang on to the Golden Glove Award. And the League One players of the season are Lanahan, Penrice, and Hawk Ridge on top. Sam Julian in goal, though he did not occupy any other spaces. But Barnsley gets six players on that list. With losses of over four million, the tax burden was over three. We do have one that we could cash in on now for four plus million, but it meant we would have been at least a million in profit. So I decided not to for the time being maybe a mistake maybe not uh, but commercial summary 100, 140k previous deal is now 230k sponsorships up by 30 corporate and hospitality went up by 500,000 from the previous season this is all from this year by the way this is not going into next year uh, match day commercial retail went up by 200,000 competition prize money went up by 180k and broadcast revenues went up by a couple of thousand that's a pretty healthy increase and as we head to the championship I would expect it's going to be significantly more including the sponsorships changes in ticket prices a 15% rise average ticket price was 30 now it's going to be 35 average season ticket price going up by 60 dollars projected yearly earnings is going to drop to 3.79 million with the increased cost and people not coming by the way an average ticket price of 35 is freaking nothing season tickets to the portland thorns nwsl national women's soccer league right most many many people would argue against the equality of that sport to the men's game and yet I comfortably pay more than twice that for my seats and it makes sense I I've heard a lot of complaints over the last year over ticket prices going up in the UK guys are so spoiled we pay so much more we pay two three four times what you pay in the UK and those prices are going up end of season review Yes, it was disappointing that we finished second, but we went from a minus 18 to a plus 50. We turned around a goal and a half per game in one season. What a turnaround. And, you know, that includes that terrible collapse in the final five games where we had a 1-1 draw and it was the last goal we scored all season. We went goalless in the last four only gave up four with three of them coming in a single game we did draw three of the five actually so we still got three points out of those final five matches but we just could not find the net anymore uh, the offense went missing down the stretch and, and that decided the, the the season and you know when you add in as the pressure started to pile on barnsley beat us birmingham city 
the other two teams going up with us both managed to beat us down the stretch that being the ultimate difference we certainly had been informed otherwise we had been informed for quite a while we hadn't lost since Tranmere in December but it is what it is you, you know at some point a team such as ours is only going to make such a leap and we almost exceeded that by a wide wide margin in the end somebody had a cast a net for us to catch us to stop us from uh absolutely jaw-dropping terrible performances at the end which is worrying heading into the championship that we don't yet appear to be a team that is at that level just yet uh, 6,500 per game average home attendance. That is a massive jump from where we had been. Uh, FA Cup went out in the second round. Carabao Cup went out in the first round. But we did get to the semifinal of the Papa John's Trophy. We had had six straight wins up to that point. That hand Penrice is so much better as a winger than he is as a striker. And that has been a problem for us the last couple of years since he took over. It really wasn't that great this year, even with 23 goals. The wingers behind him combined for 30 plus they all had at least 10 and walker played a lot he also got into double digits so all four of those attacking trio managed to score 10 plus while lanahan penry's on top playing the majority of the games in fact he played the most of anyone all season outside of sam julian and he still only you know doubled up on what they did from that position it's not a great performance. Sam Lyons did really well. Uh, McCartney was pretty decent. Backline, right on the edge of a 7. 6.99 for Webb, 6.98 for Rossini. Uh, even Ward improved at a 6.87. And McFadden, better than we're used to seeing with him, down in the 6.6s six or 6.7s. Fullbacks in the system, the way it's set up, just don't quite. I, I know that there's issues with ability. I've never had a good fullback, right? I've been stuck with the same two guys forever, and I finally have a replacement in Lee Ward, and he spent this season overtaking and becoming better and clearly put in a better performance in the end, but only slightly. Next season might be a different story as he continues to develop, and we might finally have a decent fullback. So we've never had a good one, but they always underperformed, and I think that's the system as much as anything else the, it's asking too much of them we're asking for complete wingbacks when we don't have it when we've never had it but now that we're getting into the championship and that development scales up a level further maybe just maybe we'll finally get there archie jones six assists 12 goals i don't think that's player of the season category but he was consistently good i think player of the season is probably going to come down to sam julian uh, for the fans it was james wilkinson Young player goes to Archie Jones. Goal of the season also to Jones. Top goal scorer, of course, Lana and Penry's most assists was Wilkinson with 11. Player of the matches, Archie Jones with 6. Highest rating went to Archie Jones. Most passes completed per 90. Christopher Joseph. He did really well coming in, uh, filling in as that third guy. Well, taking over from playing as that third guy uh, throughout the early part of the season and getting a lot of starts down the stretch. Record breakers. Redknapp, 400 appearances now for the club. Uh, Lana and Pedrice, 139 goals for the club all time. And oldest goal scorer, Chris Webb, at 26 and 290 days. It's not much of a record, is it, compared to other clubs? A look at the best 11. Brody Bick. Archie Jones has entered the best 11 now. And other than it being Mortland and Atkins, and not yet our new guys. Uh, Surprised that Davidson is still the best left winger, but Lanahan Penrice has moved around a bit too much positionally and still finds himself as the best right winger. Four or five years of drama for James Wilkinson will quickly come to an end, and this has all transpired in just three days, I think. His value was about $5.6 million. We got an offer of about $4.1 couple days ago next day stoke turned around and offered about 6.2 just slightly just slightly above his value but as i've previously noted not the type of excess that triggers the 
the I need to negotiate. It was slightly above, but that was with incentives. The base offer was still only about four and a half or four. It was well, well below his value. It was just incentives to barely push it over the mark. Uh, I saw, I could sense what was coming, but didn't sense that, for one, it would come a day later, and two, that it would come in this fashion. Not even close. The offer made, nine and a half million. The board has accepted it on their own. Problem here is twofold. Uh, one, there's some additional fees, which is nice, but uh, after league appearances, two and a half million. Percentage of profit from next sale, only 20%. And 50 games on the league appearances required. Ooh, arrange friendly. Uh, that'll make a little money, I suppose. But we've known for years that Wilkinson wanted to go, wanted to have a bigger challenge, and now he's going to go from a championship club to a championship club. At least I think Stoke is currently a championship club. They might not be. Oh, but they are. Uh, they finished 12th last season. Now, that's certainly above us, and they do have a bigger reputation. But Wilkinson is uh, about to part ways and become opposition now the good news on this one is we have an immediate replacement in lanahan penrys who i just talked about four days ago five days ago no it might have been weeks actually i've i've done a lot of staff work uh, over the last month uh, setting up deals i have like three upgrades to the staff otherwise we still can't find upgrades out there it's weird how four or five years ago i found a whole new wave of staff that was massively better than anything we found and we climbed the ladder we're heading to the championship and i can't find better than guys that i had when we were down in like the national league it's strange but it is the circumstances anyway looks like wilkinson's heading out and yeah like i said line ahead pen race at the wing is fine but what do i do for those goals because i was just noting how he's not doing a great job of it and Hewitt, his primary backup, certainly hasn't done a very good job and looks like he's going to be that striker. I might have to look into the 21s or 18s and see if there's somebody there to bring in, bring up, and quickly convert into the starter and give a chance, which means we will struggle early in the season, but I think we're going to struggle early in the season anyway with some rapid development. Maybe uh, a good primary goal scorer will emerge. Anyway. Looks like we're going to part ways with Wilkinson, but it also looks like we're going to do so for a very healthy fee, which is going to put the club in a strong financial position going forward. New club reputation rankings with Chelsea, by the way. Uh, we had done a check-in with a few matches left to go in the season. Chelsea overcame Man City to win the title. Arsenal second, Liverpool, and Man City are the four with the maximum five-star reputations. Uh, Tottenham, Newcastle, Leeds, Man United, the ones with four and a half, Man United, working their way back up. They actually had a decent season for a change. Uh, Aston Villa, Brighton, Wolves, Southampton, Brentford, Leicester City, West Ham, and Norwich make up the next tier, the continental levels. That, of course, quickly brings us into the championship level. We know that we are not going to be anywhere near there, but you can see championship sides at three and a half or three stars being kind of the standard. So national reputation, three star is what it is expected to be a championship side by Barnsley. No surprise that they're at the top of this list in Birmingham City. Uh, you're still at that three star. In fact, they improved their reputations from two and a half to three stars with their performances this season. And then we're dropping into that two and a half star territory with the bleed over of the last couple championship sides at the top league one sides. Uh, you would expect us to be there, but as we're still a new club and still building that reputation, we're constantly playing catch up, but we have caught up a fair bit, right? We know that we're on to two star territory, so we're getting closer, but just how much further down will that place us? We hit the first League Two sides in Oxford United at the beginning of the two-star rankings. So League One comes in almost entirely with two-and-a-half-star teams. 
all of the championship sides are already in by two and a half stars. So we are lagging behind in that department and we still have not caught League One. But we're getting closer as we are at two star territory. And you're getting into the bulk of the League Two sides and the very last of the League One sides when we do eventually show up on the list. We are finally ahead of the likes of Barnet and South End United who are National League teams. We are way, way off from where they are. So we, we've actually grown a lot this year. We really grew a lot. I don't know why they're saying our previous rep was two stars. Last year it was very much not two stars. It was nowhere near two stars. We were uh, down at local, weren't we? Weren't we at one and a half? I swear we were down here. I don't see how they're saying that we came from two. Uh, but anyway, we have climbed. We have climbed a good bit. And that we are almost, reputation-wise, mid-table league two. Of course, we are about to make the transition here in about a week to, or in a couple of days, actually, uh, to the new season to be considered championship. And even if we have a bad season, we will see our reputation rise a little bit you could finish dead last and it should drop your reputation but if you were a league two reputation playing in the championship the league alone even we, we just have to make sure we score some points right we're not going to get any reputation if we find ourselves finishing the season on like five points that would see our reputation drop but anyway big step big 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 step in the reputation but just to even get to a reputable League One level, right? We need another half star and to move past a lot of teams and to, of course, eventually reach championship. I think we're at least two seasons away from making it to that three star level. But man, oh man, are we up that list. In terms of reputation, Bristol Rovers and Forest Green are still above us even though they are both down in League 2 and we are headed to the championship. But we have absolutely, in terms of level, we've left them behind. Now we just have to have the reputation to match it. The next team on our radar for Southwest region top reputation right, is going to be Bristol City. They come in as the number two most reputable club in the region. They're kind of right on the edge there at Bristol City. But they are in that three-star, and they are in that championship, which we are about to compete in. Following that one is Bournemouth, who currently are not in the Premier League, but are a highly reputable championship club. They are near the top end. They, in recent performance, they were 7th, 8th, 7th, 6th the last four years. While Bristol City, you can see how they've dropped a couple times and then yo-yoed right back up. But they've been at times mid-table and more frequently at the bottom end. 13th, 10th, 14th, 18th a year ago. So that's definitely going to be our closest thing to a rival this coming season. But this will put us in the same tier as literally the last two clubs within the entire region in the pyramid. So we make it three from the Southwest region at this level. Nothing at the Premier League without Bournemouth there. Nothing in League One. And those two clubs that are now well behind us in League Two, except a little bit ahead of us in reputation. If we can avoid relegation this season, I would think that that would be enough to at least get us on par with those two in reputation by the end of the season, if not above them. I don't think we're going to be anywhere near Bristol City, but I think they'll be our target to try to beat this coming season. Love that they're offering a bigger payroll budget. I had one attempted hire for a coach that we could not hire because of our limitations on this one, so that's definitely going to help us out. And of course, our Coventry City link is now officially severed as we are both in the championship. And we do fall into a uh, squad selection rule here in the championship but we'll have no problem getting 25 players selected or less we've been uh, traditionally at about 22 23 the last couple seasons i believe across all competitions we had 5700 fans per game of course we had over just over 6000 for the league but our previous record was 2700 getting into the new stadium getting back home 
doubled our attendance and was a real help. Huge increase for TV rights in the coming season as we're going to be in the championship three and a third million. Fulham are a club that yo-yoed for many, many years in real life before starting this playthrough. And then once starting this playthrough, continued that yo-yo status for quite a few years, occasionally staying put in the Premier League. But finally, after a relegation in 2030, they have stayed in the championship since then with 5th, 3rd, 5th, and 15th place in the league. So three years of right there, right on the edge, nearly getting promotion once again uh, via playoff, but missing out each of those years before having a big drop-off last year to just 15th place. <clears throat> Not only have they dropped off, but they are now under transfer embargo. They have entered administration, and they are in serious debt. Their net debt is $253 million. And while they did technically make a small profit this last year, languishing in the championship with the contracts that they would have had those first few years coming down from the Premier League is what's putting them in this position now. Last season, they began to address it, and that's the sudden drop in the standings. This year, obviously, they're going to have to take that a step further and could because of the previous years, even though, yes, last year they were profitable, but over the the set of years they probably are not within ffp uh, or hadn't been within FB, ffp and last year possibly did not offset enough uh, i believe their parachute payments probably have run out it's three years i believe three years of parachute payments hence the uh they had three years of coming really close to going right back up before having this huge change last year so it looks like they sold a ton of players and are massively massively in debt and this could spiral further could possibly uh, we we might be looking at points deductions meaning fulham is absolutely a candidate for relegation this season and that's really good news for us because i think we are a candidate for relegation this year oh that hey there you go <laughs> Next email, four minutes later, Fulham have been deducted 12 championship points for going into administration. So they are starting on negative 12. They were already just 15th, and I would imagine that they, with the embargo and or just through fire sale to try to balance the books and stay afloat, uh, could be getting worse as a club. So they could find themselves dead last this season and by a wide margin meaning now instead of three clubs getting relegated we could be looking more along the lines of Fulham plus two. As our first look at championship level FFP board investment the maximum is 27.6 million and the finances over a three-year period there's that three-year period part uh, a maximum of 17.25 million currently at 16.4 Archie Jones looking for a new contract, and I think I'm happy to oblige. All right, so here is the stats, because our FFP here is different than what we faced previously. We are allowed losses of 17.25 million. Current, 16.4 million. Oh no, the numbers are close to the same. Oh wait, hold on, look at the detail. Loss permitted 17 million we are net profit 16.4 million we are on the exact opposite end of it meaning we no longer face restrictions on salaries we suddenly can actually afford to play to pay significantly more in salary than we are because we are allowed to take losses our projected for the period end is 12.36 million meaning we're going to drop by four million uh, over the next few years or over the end of this year potentially so we don't want to go crazy uh, in, in terms of our spending but we we can absolutely afford to now pay more for the guys that we have especially with Wilkinson going out not that he was making a ton 
again, we had that weird salary stuff with him rolling over year by year, and I just started increasing it to make it more respectable. And I think that's what led to the board going, hey, nine and a half million. <sighs> we haven't collected that yet. Uh, that deal's not done. So I don't think that has anything to do with this value. There are certain things that don't count, and probably like a huge stadium um, upgrade probably didn't count against us. Deal is done. James Wilkinson is no longer with the club. Nine and a half million. Straight up. Eventually can rise to 12 million with two and a half million in incentives. We do have a percentage of profit from next sale, but it's minor compared to what we are used to. But he's going to be at the same level as us anyway, so I don't expect them to make a ton of money off of him any longer. Uh, we do have an arranged friendly there you go. That is a key player gone. Uh, that is a big hole to fill, but that is a big hole uh, stuffed full of cash. Records have been broken for both an individual transfer, doubling what we had previously, but also for a single season mark, uh, $3 million on top of that. It's funny how quickly $2 million disappear as we only get credit in the bank account of $7.7 .7 million out of this one. That's okay, though, as it makes a significant difference. Overall balance now at $9.4 million. Uh, that is the biggest ever payout we've had. You can see over the long term, that's, that's it. That's a massive one. Uh, this, of course, was when we built the stadium. $22 million for that thing. This puts us in a even much, much stronger position with FFP for years to come. Kalen Plain, now gone from the club as his loan back has ended. He played 11 times on the loan back, did score a few goals, so he did get a fair bit of use, but he was ultimately our fourth defensive mid, so it didn't hurt too much to lose him, but hurting Wilkinson, uh, losing Wilkinson, obviously, is amongst the top losses. He's the best current ability and oldest uh, key player that we've ever sold and you know was at an age at 24 that he was definitely a good value in terms of the payout his value did not just suddenly jump by going to stoke it's a team with a higher reputation club with a higher valuation but it's at the same level and so he went from being seen as a guy who had roughly six billion in value but then getting paid ultimately 12 million worth well now his value is 13 million so it didn't take a big jump it did go up a little though as it seems that others would pay them something similar as to what they paid us if not more but we have issues to overcome right we have two players that are definitely championship level premier league level just about but archie jones Phil Hewitt, McCartney, Webb, Lanahan, Penrees, they're going to struggle at this level unless they can develop rapidly. And Walker and Lines and Hassel and McFadden, Lee Ward, Christopher Joseph are all right there with that other group, but will struggle even more. And so this could be a difficult season. This could be a really difficult season ahead of us. And we now have two holes to fill. And it's only the 1st of July. So more could come in terms of departures as more teams get attention on, wow, these guys got up to the championship? How did they do that? Man, I've got to have those players. right? And in particular, Atacunle and Sam Julian, I strongly fear uh, for the attention that's going to come towards them but with three under 18s gone it thinned them out a little bit but there's still definitely a few too many players here some of them will go up to the under 21s here momentarily as they also lost a few players and definitely have room to bring some guys up but you know they actually don't even really need so much there's just extras out of the u18s of course we need to get at least a couple up here to the championship uh, level with the senior squad to replace those outgoing guys, but I really need to assess what we have. Our minimum standard, Redknapp, Kulabali, Potter, low 90s, guys that really just don't cut it anymore. Uh, Redknapp, this is like the beginning of the end for him. Rossini, it's the beginning of the end for him, especially now at this level. Same with Kulabali. Uh, Pascal Wiley, Ashley Potter, 
might still have a role to play. But in terms of current ability, no one in the U18s is good enough to come up. And in the U21s, currently only one player, Marley Whitehouse. And with that level of current ability and potential and position, where we just created a big hole for ourselves, seems a pretty obvious candidate. But for after that, we've got some decision-making ahead of us on who to bring up and how often to play them as we try to scrape by and squeeze out enough points to stay alive in the championship and not face relegation. That's going to do it for this episode, though. I'm the Cathalon Gamer. Like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Have a good one. Be safe out there. Bye for now.